everyone. I'm Jessica Hornstein. Welcome to the No Not Crazy podcast, where we explore the invalidating messages we internalize, their effects on our lives, and the ways we can free ourselves from them. We've all had those experiences that make us question ourselves and even sometimes feel a little crazy. Let's stop accepting the idea that there is something inherently wrong with us and begin to appreciate that actually there is something fundamentally right. So join me, and together we can all feel a little less crazy. Today I am here with Dr. Juliana Hauser. Hi, Juliana. It's so Hi. great to have you here. <laughs> it feels like we're just picking up where we left off. <laughs> I know. I know. There's so much we could talk about. Dr. Juliana is a licensed marriage and family therapist and counselor with a PhD in counseling education. For 20 years now, she's worked with clients to help them manage relationships, sexuality, confidence, infertility, and more. Her work has been featured on Oprah, The Doctors, The Discovery Channel, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Women's Health, and more. Some of her courses include Revealed, be your own sexpert in The Wanting. I'm just so excited for this conversation. On this podcast, we talk about the external messages that we are all exposed to and that often are very invalidating or at least impose an idea on us of who we are or who we should be, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. I think sexuality is certainly an area where, you know, conditioning can really run rampant, right. Mm -hmm. In our lives from so many, so many places. And I think, you know, sex and sexuality, I think often we have, you know, people have been exposed to just a very narrow concept of that and may not really know who they truly are. And, then, you know, there's a right way and a wrong way. And um, that's very suppressive, I'm, I think, to a lot of people and, you know, invalidating of who, who they really are. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm really happy you're here because I think this fits in so well. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're the sex expert. What do you see in the people that you work with? And, and, you know, why did you come to this as such an important topic? Hmm. You know, the, um, and thank you for having me on here and thank you for t- to stepping into this space because it isn't, sexuality is a space that some people really run away from and I understand it, but I, I really appreciate those who are like, let's just do it. Let's just talk let's about it. it. Yeah. Um, you know, what I see, I see a wide variety of people that are coming to me to work individually or just to the topic of sexuality in general for, for different reasons. But some of the common links are that uh, we all have been given horrible sex education, and so we feel ill-informed in a lot of ways. And it's not just the anatomy, it's not just the, lo- the logistics that we weren't given, but we weren't given the reason why sexuality is so potent. And I mean potent as in something that is so divisive, something that is used in movies and um and marketing uh that it is a you know the top in the top two of why marriages don't work in some science you know some studies it's why is it so important we're not taught why is sexuality so important and we're not really taught what it is mm-hmm. and and so that's the basics of why people come to me the details have a whole variety to anywhere from pain to mismatched desire to i don't know if i've had an orgasm to sexual trauma um and then to me i i view um sexual sexuality in a holistic way so i really believe that sexuality is the essence of who we are and so everything revolves around it and everything comes back to it. And I ask, I always ask people about their mm-hmm. sexual lives, whether they're in a relationship or not. And, and that what I have found is people are really hungry to be asked about who they are, sexual beings, and, and they're really wanting a safe space 
to ask questions, to, to explore, or to see if what they are thinking and doing is quote normal or common, or how can it be better? Mm. Um, and so that's a lot of the conversations revolve around that. It's so interesting because I think so many people think of you know sex is the sex act, right? And that's it. And not only is that it, but you know it's it's a performance or it's a, it's a race, you know? And, and like sometimes I just, I think like, Hey, everybody, like, this is not a pass fail exam, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it should not be pass fail. Um, so there is, there's such a broad range, right. That mm -hmm. often is not explored. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, uh, we're, we're, no one thinks that they have the right sexuality. Mm. And that was something that I've learned over the years too, is that the way that we are exposed to sexuality is, is that there's a right and a wrong and, uh, and nobody has it right. And everyone has an opinion and everyone has it come from and an agenda. And that's a lot to unpack. And it's confusing. And then you'll hear people say, oh, it's wonderful. You should want this. And, and so how do you get from there to here? And that's kind of where my sweet spot is. Mm -hmm. And I believe that everything is rooted in agency, that there is no right or wrong way of, of experiencing your sexuality and your sexual journey, and that you need to learn how to ask your questions and how to discover who you are as a sexual being to then figure out what you need and what you want and your yeses and nos and yucks and yums. And and then if you decide to partner with anybody um, or, or ever have sexual connection with other people, then you're going to figure out how to do that alongside somebody else who is hopefully doing the same kind of journey. And some of that just seems magical that it actually ever works and is, it is good <laughs> and wonderful and exciting and, and all of that. And, um, and I love it when people can make that transition too. And I think for me to, to answer your, one of your earlier questions of like, how did I get into this? I'm a pretty unlikely person to um, to have this be the area of interest. And when people, when I interact with people from my childhood or, or even from college, because I started off as a kindergarten teacher, they're like, how did you, what in the world? <laughs> like, how did that happen? And, um, and I, and I, well, it's because everyone has sexuality. Everybody does. And I'm curious, I'm probably more curious than a lot of people and more comfortable. I don't know how I got comfortable with sexuality, but I did. And when I saw how, like when I got comfortable talking about it and exploring and asking questions, then um, it changed a lot in my life. I, I found agency. I found, I found my, my terms in my life through the lens of sexuality first. And when when I figured that out, that changed a lot in my life and I figured out how to do it in other areas. And so that's how I found sexuality to be really important. It wasn't the sex acts. It, it was the holistic sexual being of me. It's hard, right? With, I mean, whether it's sexuality or, or all the other things that I, you know, I talk about on this podcast, but it's very hard when you've been so conditioned, right? That you can't separate out necessarily, you know, it's a, as you said, you use the word unpack, there's so much to unravel and you can't even know when, you know, when that's so internalized, right. Mm -hmm. to, to, to parse out what's actually you and what's actually what you've been told and heard and seen on TV and you know, what somebody else wants of you or, so how do you help people know like, oh no, if I, you know, if I were just out in the wild, you know, <laughs> like, who, who would I be sexually as opposed to what did I pick up from, from society or my family or my culture? How, how do you begin to separate that out? I mean, it, it's complicated and it's, and it's, and it's not a, an, an hour. It doesn't happen in an hour. It, it is a process that you have to go through. So sometimes it depends on where they're starting, but I have two kind of big buckets that, that I always go through with my clients and I did it with my own life too. And one is, it's really similar to decluttering a closet that we look at sexual messaging and um, what like different topics. So what do we think about self-pleasure? What do you think about monogamy? What do you think about uh, religion and, and sexuality? What do you think about um, what pleasure is in general? Like, there's a whole list of things that we go through. And with each of these topics, just have my clients start writing down. What messages did you receive about this topic? Was self-pleasure, masturbation, but self-pleasure, was it dirty? Was it wrong? Was it secretive? What were you told not to do that? Or, or were you affirmed in it? And what, what experiences did you have? 
Uh, what did you observe? What did you hear? And we sush through and sometimes it takes a while for those cobwebs to, to untangle it too. And we go through all the topics and then we start looking at it. So, so does that work for you? Where did this story come from? Is this your story? Is this, was this handed down to you? And does it work for where you are now? Do you need this message? Do you need this value? Do you need this viewpoint um, in where you're heading in the, with your sexual self? And it goes into three categories. It's, you know, it's thrown out completely. It's just absolutely not mine, not truth for me. Um, it needs to be recycled, um, that we need to tweak it a little bit. Like some of it works, some of it doesn't. And then others like, yeah, it does. This fits for me. It's it remained constant. And it's interesting listening to people go through this process because again there's a lot of questions where we don't we don't prioritize our sexuality so oftentimes it feels like a luxury to even ask these questions to ourselves instead of a necessity but it's really a necessity to do this and so they go through it and, and they're not sure and there's a lot of hesitancy about it and it, it often begins with sex acts so it, it begins with what we were all originally taught what sex was and then I move it typically uh, then into holistic sexuality. So I have 10 parts of sexuality that I think match and that's pleasure, it's desire, it's behaviors and practices, it is sensuality, it's health and reproduction, it's love and intimacy, it's relationship, connection, sexualization, identity, and then agency. So then we go through all of those and we start looking at what, what works for you and what doesn't and who are you? and and we, we aren't afraid of the I don't knows. And that sometimes can happen in the untangling and unraveling. It's, it's, it's really scary to not know. You think you have to know the answer, but we just have a tone of curiosity through it. And eventually you start stepping into those places of, I don't know this, but I know this. And, um, and eventually we move more to the place of, I think this, and I'll see. And here are the places where I need to know more about myself mm. and what I think. And I need to, I need to either learn more or I need to start asking myself more. And it's a pretty pivotal moment when people realize they have the right to decide what's right for them over what everyone else is telling them, society or family or relationship or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I would imagine sometimes there's a lot of fear for people to acknowledge, acknowledge things around that that may um, sort of put their their role, right? Change their role in their family or change change mm -hmm. their how they they see themselves in the world. And mm -hmm. that can be really scary for people. Yes, and to, to step in the truth of who you are, it's scary to do it alone, like just acknowledging that privately. And then it's another layer to, to step into those relationships that were already formed and had a view of you or had an experience of you. And you have to, if, if you're doing this coming to yourself in the context of relationships with others, no matter what the relationship is, family or, or romantic or children, the other person or people have to give space for this new realization, this new revelation of who you are so that you can reclaim it and keep relationships that work for you. And yes. sometimes it means ending relationships that don't work for you anymore. And that's a very brave and hard space too. It is. It is. And sounds like you, one of the things that you really encourage is that people find a group or a space, anybody who, where they can be that, that vulnerable with and that open with, and it's a safe space to explore or discuss any any of those things and you know people will will say like they need to do all this individual work on their on their on their own and, and there is there has to be a part of a private self-reflection and, and accountability and and insight that has to happen so that you're not influenced by others but then you have to interact in the world and you, you do need to to kind of try on the new clothing and see how it fits and in these relationships and and it's a skill to give information about yourself to somebody else and have them witness it instead of having them give their opinion mm -hmm. um, advice or thoughts on it and those relationships are such rich important relationships especially when you're doing the new revelation of you what kind of languaging would you say people could use that might be helpful in those situations where you want to share, you don't want somebody's advice, but you mm -hmm. want to be able to be open about, about who you are. 
So I do this with my clients and my personal life. So whenever anyone's sharing, and then I do it myself proactively, is I I will check in. So I'll just say if I'm sharing something about myself, I will check in to say, what do I need? Do I need someone just to witness this? Do I need them to, to give me advice? Do I need them to give me their thoughts? And then if someone is, comes to me, I'll ask that question. So it's already from the beginning. I, I know what my role is or I know what I know what to ask for. And if if someone or if you are just needing the witnessing part of it, then it's simply thank you for sharing a part of you with me. You know, beautiful to witness your self discovery or your your knowledge. And that's it, which is not it as in like a little it like that's that's the sentence. <laughs> that's right, that's right. where it ends. And it can be disarming. Because in a lot of ways we we have socialized ourselves that the polite good thing to do as a friend or whatever is to really do all this affirmation or or you know it's a valuable discussion when you can counter it and do critical thinking with them and there's space for that but we've missed the art of just sitting there saying I see you and uh, and that's a powerful sentence too absolutely well that's at the at the heart of what I'm doing too which is exactly <laughs> why. Because, I mean, in so many ways, people are not feeling seen, not feeling heard, right? The name is No Not Crazy because I just kept hearing people over and over being like, am I crazy? I'm not crazy, right? (laughs) And, you know, similar to what the kinds of things you hear where people are like, oh, this can't be normal. This can't be right. Or everybody else is doing it differently. There's that self-doubt, right? And that that questioning of what, what does maybe feel right to you or what you think might feel right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, It's a tough space, (laughs) but freeing. And I mean, I love the name of your podcast and I love the premise of it. The phrasing may sound different, but that's, that's a lot of the questions that people don't know where to ask. You have a very small bubble of people you can trust in your private life for most people about asking sexual questions or questions about who they are as a sexual being, Mm -hmm. which means we don't get modeling. We don't get to hear examples. We don't get to hear how do you say it and how do you not say it? And we just walk around in our little shame bubbles or questioning Mm -hmm. bubbles and and expect to have a vibrant sexual life (laughs) after after all of that. Right. Yeah, how can we enjoy it if you know, first of all, it's not even true to you, maybe, or, or you have the shame about it. How would they, you know, how do you recommend after they've done their work? And in an ideal world, as you said, their partner would be sort of on a journey or, or open. How do you recommend that people approach that with their partners in a way where it may be well received? Certainly, that must be a scary thing to do. And the last thing you want is somebody being like, oh, you know, or, or getting upset because maybe they feel shamed. So you don't want to present something in a way, right, where your your partner is feeling that it means it's some reflection of them and what they're, what they're doing or not doing. And so how, how do you recommend people approach that kind of conversation in a way where everybody kind of can come out of it feeling feeling heard and seen and validated for who they are and what they want. Mm-hmm. It's tricky. I mean, that's, that's the first part that, that, that I'll, I'll say to people is like this, this is an art form to this that has been kept from us. And so we're, <laughs> we're discovering it together. And so you just have to loosen the reins of, of anxiety and worry with that. And again, adopt the philosophy and the, and the viewpoint of curiosity. Curiosity, it can, it is just the self to a lot of things. Um, and when you're stepping into the, to the sexuality space, because it really removes judgment and it really removes the right and wrong. It, and it really helps be a bridge um, in a relationship rather than a divider. And it's harder than you think. Uh, It is instinctive for a lot of people to be like, the what? Like, you want what? Uh, Like, before they can help it, like, we could talk for 10 minutes about curiosity and have all the verbiage, and then it happens. And they're like, oh, it just, (laughs) 
you know, and how do you, so we do lots of like, how do you walk back when you've done an automatic judgment? How do you walk it back? And how, how do you, how do you um, create a safe space again? So the first thing I always do is what do you need to feel safe? What do you need to feel safe to be emotionally vulnerable uh, and to show up authentically to somebody? And so I go through that with every, every couple and it's, what do you need from the other person to feel safe? What do you need from the environment to feel safe? And what are you responsible for on creating safety um, for yourself in this interaction so that you can show up authentically and, and with vulnerability. And it's interesting how couples that have been together years have no idea what the other person needs to feel safe um, or they don't know how to answer it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's a quick thing and sometimes it's, we do a lot of work in that because you have to have safety in order to um, to really feel in any way aligned with who you are as a sexual being because it's so judged, because it's so mysterious, and because we're not educated about it. And then when we have that kind of established, and it's it's not perfection, it's just progress and safety, progress and communication um, and curiosity, then we, we, you know, with couples, what you want to do is, is figure out, do you, do you know why? Sexuality is important to your relationship. Like, do you, what is the why? And, and the answers are often kind of regurgitating what we've been taught, but not the why. It's like, well, you're just supposed to. Like, it's, if you don't have sex, then you're not in a happy marriage, or you got to please each other or, or whatever. And, and that's a starting point for a lot of people, but that's, that it's not going to get you a fulfilling sexual life. And then there's a lot of times that we expect our partner, if we're with one person, to meet all of our needs and um, and that you let go of what you need to provide for yourself in your sexual life. So we do that dance of why is sexuality important in a relationship? Why is it something that we've made so sacred beyond procreation? But like, what is this about? What is it doing for you? And why should it be a priority? And then um, what... Uh, what what are you doing to make your your sexual life vibrant not just your sex life with your partner vibrant and that can take some time to to unpack a whole lot um, within it and people's whys are different about why sexual connection is so important but in general for me why i think it's so important for couples people in their life too but for those who are a couple it is that it's it's such a it, it is such a unique place to show up authentically mm. And there's, and there's so often people are, as they grow up in their sexual selves, they are, you said it earlier, it's, there's a performance aspect to it, that there's a removal either through like alcohol and drugs that that's when they can let loose. And so there's, there's a disconnect in, in that space of showing up authentically, or they think this is what their partner likes, or this is what it's supposed to sound like. And they don't really know what brings their body pleasure and how can they relax into that? And then how can they find their edges? So that's gonna one of the last places we, we do all that. And then I love getting to the places of like, what are your edges? And everyone gets to define what their edges are. For some people, it you know, may feel unspeakable to say what, what their edges are. And for others, it's like, really, that's your edge? Not That's not how I feel, but like, you know, in the general sense of things, and it's so beautiful when I love witnessing people just saying, this, this is a yes, this is a yes, this is a yep, and this is a no. And this is a no too. If you're coupled with somebody, when you find those yeses together, it's just super yummy. And when you find your no's together, I find that to be super yummy. Um, and I, I love encouraging people to not be afraid to see things in themselves again with safety and consent um and to find that no's are are not the worst thing in the world they're, they're just as important and as powerful as a yes and just to find lightness sex is sexual connection is just weird and messy and you know there's just all sorts of odd things that happen when you're actually getting to the sex acts itself right and so if you can find lightness and humor in that process and again curiosity that also helps you to understand why yes Yes, sleep is fantastic, but your sexual life has to be good enough, filling enough and authentic enough that it that it feels like a good option over sleep at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's supposed to be fun, right? Like, yeah, it's supposed to be enjoyable and feel good. Yeah. Enjoyable, I mean, that it's kind of the part of the point, right? And not not a 
thing to stress about or yeah as i said you know as you're saying it's it's not a performance and if we could remove all that that judgment and that stress, self-judgment even or you know outside judgment and and stress about that they carry us a long way <laughs> it, it does and and the other part too like once we can get through that part of things and again like we're i'm talking about like sifting through so much then when people like oh i get it I get what you're saying, Juliana. And okay, so now what? So now you've opened this door. Like, where? What? Are, what are my options at this mm. point? And there's a couple of things that I like to to tell people too. And one is like, so sensuality is the first whole the whole first pillar of sexuality that I, that I talk about with with people. And you know, you hear that phrasing: what happens inside the bedroom happens outside the bedroom. And although not all sex happens in the bedroom the phrase stands and and so sensuality is a really great place for this because although we not everybody has every sense or capability of the senses in the same ways we all have some of them at, at the least and and when you when you understand who you are as a sensual person like what what you're drawn to hearing wise your turn ons and your turns off inside sexual connection and outside sexual connection you start learning other parts of yourself and that builds upon the other pillar of, of pleasure and the other pillar of desire, which is when you start thinking about like the, my, my first 15 minutes of the conversation about pleasure with people is what is your relationship with pleasure? Do you deny yourself? And I'm not even talking about sex. Do you, are you somebody that it's, it's when you're asked how you're doing busy, busy, busy. And that's like the compliment that you're a very busy person. Are you somebody that, that just doesn't pay attention to the blissful moments in a day, in a millisecond, and those, those little micro bursts of joy. Um, and then you overindulge, or are you somebody that is, has more of an even way of looking at joy and pleasure and desire in your life and vibrancy in your life. And when you start knowing that parts of yourself, and then you start understanding, ah, this isn't just about penetrative sex. That's not what she's talking about. We're talking about, do you understand how being pleasure filled can change your life mm -hmm. and enrich all aspects of your relationship and all different kinds of relationship? Do you understand that? Yes, we're talking about libido and desire, but really what we're really talking about is vibrancy. What do you do to feed the vibrancy in your life? I'm not talking about vibrancy and sex acts, just in your soul what yes. are you doing and all of that feeds upon itself and then all of a sudden you're like okay we're talking about the whole person and then that allows you because it that helps that helps understand the why more it helps us move into sex sex isn't like isn't just like a perfunctory thing it is it's a crucial aspect of who we are then you can start doing things like this one exercise and, and, and then i'll stop with with that part of it is this four quad, quadrant exercise that i think is it's just brilliant i didn't come up with it it's it's out there in the world so much that there's no one really knows who started it and it's very simple but really really powerful but it takes a while to get to this place like you have to do all, some of the other work to really have it have this really work and you divide a paper in vertical and horizontal so you have four quadrants and one quadrant is um, sex acts that I've done that I, I wanna try again. The next is sex acts that I've done that I don't think I wanna try anymore. Sex acts, the third is sex acts that I haven't tried, but I think I want. And the last is sex acts that I haven't tried that I think I don't wanna try. And then you get this long list of, of sex acts, everything from like having my hand kissed to mm -hmm. like the most like make you blush statement that you have to look up the definition of, then you start filling it in. And you, if you're even if you're if you're in a relationship, you do it individually, and and you don't get so tied to this. Isn't it set in stone? This is just who you are on that day and how you're feeling. You you don't you're not the way that I do it is you're not allowed to to waffle. You have to choose if there's, if it's on the paper, you have to choose which quadrant it goes into, and that is, is really confronting to some people to have to make a choice. And people are like, well, it all depends on it. Just and I get it. The context matters for sure, but in general, like yeah, still choose. And then you look at it and you do this analysis of what your quadrants are and and you look at so what judgments do you have what shame is popping up for you what quadrant do you want nobody to see <laughs> you're like right. yeah, you're hiding this kind of thing from and it tells you a lot and then if you're coupled you share it you create that safe space and you share it and it's so fun when you find the play the commonalities and it's really fun when you find the differences when that adds a lot to sexual connection and who you are as a sexual being too mm. i think like in any aspect of um 
a relationship. It sounds like such an important part of this is approaching it as a team, Mm -hmm. you know, and I I think that people miss this in relationships all the time. And, um, is that you're on the same side. Like the idea is that you're on the same side, right. In, in a healthy relationship that you're trying to come to a place where everybody's happy. Everybody's getting their needs met as much as possible. And how, how, how do we get there together? Mm -hmm. How do you, like you, you're, you're supposed to, the relationship is supposed to make your lives better mm-hmm. and enrich each other's experience with each other. And so often we get in the way of that. And um, you're right. I, I agree. And, and teamwork is, it's not inherent in some relationships and that's not by any fault in some ways, it's just what they've seen or it's their protective mechanisms um, or just a lack of, of resource in it. And so some, some of that can be taught. And then some couples just naturally fall into that that they just, they see issues and challenges as them together looking at it instead of sparring over it. And some people are, are just arguers and yeah. see everything as 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 a mere, mere them. Mm-hmm. Well, and we certainly, you know, have a ways to go as a culture because, you know, especially like between men and women, there's always this sort of pitting against each other, right? Oh, well, men are going to be this, women are going to be that, you know? And so it's sort of inherent, you know, we're taught to expect that that that's how it'll be. Mm-hmm. That this, this person is going to have this whole other thing that they want and that's not going to match with me and we're going to have to fight it out for power or who gets yeah. their way and who, you know, who doesn't get their way. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's something we all have to reflect on see how we, we could see that differently. And encourage that. So like when I ask people about like, you know, what, what their needs are, I ask, are you somebody that people can, and your partner or people in your life can share their needs with? Do you ask like, what kind of partner are you showing up as? And not just what, what you're needing from somebody else. And that, I think that gets over, overlooked a lot. And like when we, when we are feeling a lack, which sometimes that is the case, sometimes it's, it is the other person and it's not us, but, um, but sometimes it's the way that we're showing up too. And, um, we need to learn those skills and feel brave enough to learn those skills too and and uh and 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 in your sexual life we want to be cheerleaders for each other and Mm -hmm. it can feel scary enough to figure out who you are it can also feel really scary like like, what if i find out my partner who i've already committed to or they've they've changed um and they find a different part of themselves what if that doesn't align with me anymore what if what do i what do i do now Mm -hmm if we have these big differences. So, so sometimes people will say, I, I don't want to poke the bear. Like, I don't need to know what I don't need to know. Or, you know, I don't want to stir up trouble here. Like, it's fine living at this level until it isn't. Um, and, and looking at each other as a team is, is a crucial element of making mm-hmm. it work. What do you do when somebody, you know, is in that space and, and it's not received the way they hoped for, mm-hmm. you know? I think that that must come up a lot. I can't go there. Mm-hmm. It's this tough space and it's it's a place where it feels again like pretty sacred of like we're walking into the truth, especially if you've done the work. If you've done the work to show up authentically and genuinely about who you are and I've done all the safety stuff and you look at each other like, whoa, this is a difference. This is a core difference. And I'm not talking about something like, you know, small, you know, that, that there's not a lot at stake, but I'm talking about the difference between this is a compromise for the relationship versus a compromise of my soul. Mm-hmm. Compromises for the relationship. There's just a negotiation that, that happens and a back and forth. And, and that's, you know, a lot of the space where I stay with people, but there are certainly times that couples come to me and it is a compromise of the soul. And when that's the case, it's just rare that it that it's meant to 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 progress. Mm-hmm. And you know, Glennon Doyle used this phrase, and it became pretty popular, which is that relationships don't fail; they complete. And it's sometimes that's what my my role is is to help a relationship complete, mm-hmm. because if you're compromising your soul for a relationship, it will change you and change the relationship mm-hmm. in ways 
that it was very hard to live, live in. How would you make that distinction? Like, how would you help somebody understand that distinction for themselves, whether this is compromising my soul or this is just compromising, you know, something I can give? Sometimes there's a, there's a nuance to it. And sometimes it's a personality thing. You have to be pretty self-aware to really tune into how I answer it. And that's that you can feel it in your bones. You can feel it. And there's a, sometimes, so it's a difference of like anxiety you have an anxiety about something or irritation or annoyance or just like a like a, like a reactive thing mm -hmm. that's more a compromising for the relationship moment typically but a guttural like sick feeling like that that's churning of your stomach it's a more of a whole body reaction to it that is consistent and has a depth to its feeling that's more that falls into the compromise of the soul mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean sometimes it's the most peaceful part of you that knowing it's not this reactive thing sometimes it is but it's there's often this grief that people present when they their body their soul is telling them this is a compromise for of my soul the other thing is i have found it to be harder for people to articulate something that's a compromise of their soul than it is something that's a compromise for the relationship they can debate on a witness stand and it's like a you know it's a courtroom <laughs> in some ways when it's a compromise um but when it's a core thing uh sometimes it's difficult more difficult for them to communicate it at yes first. yes yeah i think a lot of times when people feel like they're confused you know, or they don't know the answer to something. It's, it's not so much that it's more that they're afraid of the answer or they don't like the answer, mm -hmm. but they actually know it. Agreed. Yeah. Right. Well said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I've been there. Sure. I, like, I don't want to face this. I don't want this to be true. And the consequences of what will come to bear after I speak this truth or I walk away from this or, yeah. or whatever, that's, that's difficult, but your, your soul still knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the other side of it mm -hmm. is a whole, a whole other experience of life. Yes. Yep. When you're, when you're in, living in your truth like that. Yes. Yeah. So how did this, how did you get to this, to this work? You said you were sort of an unlikely person and you were a kindergarten teacher and what compelled you or how did that path lead you to this? So I um I, I was always a very curious child. Like the, the joke in my family was that like I would run around naked everywhere and my sister would be horrified by <laughs> me being naked. And that sounds pretty uh stereotypic of an answer at first, but yeah, there that there was some of that that I just had this comfort and I was just always asking questions and very curious about bodies, very curious about what any of that kind of meant just not knowing and and my parents did the best they could with how they were raised too but they were both really conservative and both in the medical community and not very comfortable with the topic and pretty nervous about their kind of wildfire daughter that they that they had in some ways but I, I I never felt like it was wrong. I never felt like what I was thinking was wrong. And then I had this dichotomy. I had all this curiosity, but I also had the, the good girl syndrome. And so I had this dissonance inside me of this feels normal. This feels like it's, it feels normal to be questioning and wondering about this, but but it's also bad if you do anything about it and act on it. And so I, I live with that dissonance and not a whole lot of cognitive awareness. I just felt it. I had this one story in, in seventh grade and like the, the sex ed class you got in, in, in phys ed when, you know, at my age group. And I was so excited that I got the hot track teacher because she looked like she knew sex. I remember thinking <laughs> that like, she knows the sex. So I want to get all my I'm going to get some good information uh, finally. Uh, right. yeah, like, okay. Yes. <laughs> and uh and she yeah. let us you know, put up these, these pieces of paper. We could ask questions and she handled it so well. And I had this thing that if I am surprised or really embarrassed about something, my face turns red and I cannot control it. So I knew I'd be embarrassed. So I like, I, I did my piece of paper in a certain way so that I, when she got to it, I could control myself and like, here it goes. And she said, no questions were off limits. 
and I couldn't just figure out, I, I was like one question, like I've got 40, like, oh, how do I pick the one question? And this is my only shot. So I did my question. I folded a certain way. It was came my turn and she opened it up and she was like inappropriate. And she threw it in the trash can. Oh. And, and I was devastated and I felt, and of course my face ran red because I didn't expect that to happen. And I'm sure people knew. And I remember thinking this isn't right. This skin, it was just like seventh grade. It wasn't like, I was like, oh, and I'm going to be a sex educator. Like it wasn't that, but it is planted a seed. And the question was, what is the deal with discharge? And that was my question. What is the deal? And I never, I just took forever to find out the deal of it because she would, she didn't answer it. And because she deemed that inappropriate, it felt like this was a bad question to ask. Don't ask about vaginal discharge. And that is so terrible. That is not a bad question. It is not inappropriate. And it shouldn't have taken me that many years to find out the deal with it. But yeah, we didn't have Google back no, then. No, 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 no. And that wasn't in encyclopedias either. Right, right. I looked. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so then fast forward, I went away to college and I had a group of girlfriends that we all have very different sexual histories, very different sexual interest. And for some reason, and we weren't perfect. And even now when, when they hear me talking about it, they they, they will say like, really, were, were, were we like that? I was like, we were, my experience was, it was the first time that I was in a group of, especially women where um, you, you were expected to tell the truth and you were not judged for it. And so having that atmosphere of everyone sharing and we laughed and we made fun of each other and we cried with each other and we, you know, we pondered and we wondered and was again before Google. So we were just trying to figure shit out on our own. And, but what I walked away from that was, I want a community like this. Mm. I want places where I get to show up and who I am and I don't have to be like so-and-so and I can learn from that person and, and I get to, I get to figure out who I am. And, and, and a lot of it is that that era or that time was, you know, was figuring out who we are as sexual beings. And it was the first time I was really becoming sexual in my life. And then I went away, I got married really young and, uh, and I thought that's how it was like, oh, once you get it, then you, then you get it. And I realized, no. Mm -mm. And then I was married and it felt like the rules changed again. Like it was okay to talk about it when we were a boyfriend, girlfriend, but when you got married, things became sacred and quiet and secretive. And so the questions that I had about who we were as sexual beings and like, you know, really joining my sexuality with a person for, you know, for good, or, you know, I thought for good, um, I didn't know who to ask anymore. And I couldn't find other people and other, you know, that for me, it was other wives, like they weren't sharing. And so again, all these seeds got planted and I was a teacher, but then I became a counselor and, and fast forward to me getting, when I was in my doctoral program, I had one class on sex. That's it. And I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you could be a therapist and a physician and never have a class on sexuality. It's just, horrible to me, but I got, I was lucky to be in the few programs that offered this. And I was like, mm, like, Ooh, like, I love this. And my classmates were like bored and I couldn't believe that th this wasn't the best class ever that this for everyone. And my, my professor took me aside. She's like, so you're different. She's like, once the blue moon, I see somebody like you. And she's like, you really, you, you should, you should go into this. You, wow. should, you should focus on this. And, and then I started looking back on my master's program and all the, the settings I was in. And I was always drawn to sexuality stuff. I worked in an AIDS outreach program. I worked in a sexual abuse center. And I always asked my clients about their sexual life. And I didn't know other people didn't do that. It just felt like such a natural big part of our lives. Why weren't we asking it? And when I started doing training a therapist and realizing how, you know, just because therapists are humans too, and they are just as uneducated about their sexuality too. Maybe I, uncomfortable too, right? Yes, they have their, their own, own their own, own, right. Own messaging. And if you're not, if in our own training, we aren't given the chance to unpack our stuff, how in the world, you know, can we provide that in a lot of ways for other people? So, um, so I went on a mission to, you know, get a lot more educated and, 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 and I realized when you know who you are as a sexual being, it changes everything. And, and, I, and I, 
I found that it wasn't this opposite. It wasn't like, here's therapy, here's sex. It was sexuality is the final frontier of self-development. It is one of the last places our society has focused on how do you know who you are? And so then it felt exciting in another way. And it felt, you know, really passionate for me. And, and I have a whole other like personal journey in that too, that, you know, would be another podcast, but that's, <laughs> that's a bit of it. Uh, I love it. I love my work. I love helping people see that sexuality really matters and it matters more than just sex acts, although that's great too, but it really can change your life in a deepened way. And, uh, and to be a person that lives that too. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, it's, it, I think it helps you embody everything, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's physical, spiritual, it's, you know, it's emotional. It does really, the thread goes through all the other, all the other aspects of your life that are critical to who you are as well. Yeah. You get to do it your own way. I used to like have my view of what a sexual person was and that was not me. So then I must not be sexual. Mm. And that's not true. And so when that came to me too, I wanted, I wanted to just create a space for people to find out who they were and no rules, just discovery. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a skill that when you can do that in, in your sexual life, you can do it in all areas of your life and, and it becomes the game changer. Yes. Feeling comfortable about defining yourself. Yeah. Agency. Yeah, for yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now I think it's so important what you said too about, about therapists or, or any practitioners. I mean, frankly, I, I'm sure most of us women have had this experience where even, even your gynecologist, oh. right. And even, even female gynecologists, right. Where you, you think they'll understand or they'll, they'll be able to talk about this. Like it's so not a part of gynecological healthcare is to talk about any, anything really other than like, okay, everything checks out, move on. Right. They are not trained. And even when I go to like pitch uh, lectures to medical schools, they'll look at me like, we don't have time and it's not that important. And like, would you like to hear this plethora of stories of trauma that people have, especially women have, uh, women identified folk or Volvo, Volvo owning folk have in in those, in those doctor's offices, and you will not find this to be a luxury topic. It isn't. And you're right. And again, I'm not hating on the medical community. I, I just think there's more, none of us are given this. And, and it's such a statement of what we think about sexuality, that two places that are the most trusted places to go to with your mental health and your physical health are not being trained adequately. Right. To be a container for that. Yeah. And we are not given that information and that the people we're going to have not been trained in this topic unless they're willing to say it. But I'll, so I'm now probably like in some people's worst nightmare, I walk in and I'm like, if I have a new doctor, I'm like, so how much do you care about my sexual health? <laughs> and how they respond to it tells me everything. And I'm like, okay, see you later. And I know they judge me. I know they think, and people judge me for what I do. People, you know, think I'm very promiscuous or they think that that's all I do. And if that's not true, I'm just not shy about saying like my sexual health matters holistically, my sexual health matter. Does it matter to you? Because there's going to be things that are hard for me to say. There's even me, even though I have a high comfort level in this, there's still parts that I feel shamed about. There's still parts that feel awkward for me. So if you're going to be helping my sexual health, which in some cases is life or death, Mm -hmm. some cases it is like there's some cancers and some reproductive cancers that are silent killers that if we don't know how to talk about it, uh, we are, we are losing people through this men and women, all genders. And but I also do it just a little bit of a shock factor. Just right. They can't handle it. Then they're not going to, you know, there's, I'm not going to feel comfortable with them. I kind of uh, want to do that everywhere I go now. I'm going to be like at the supermarket, like, <laughs> do, you like you hey. do you care? Do you care? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's a difference. See, and and, and it, it, sometimes I get lost on people is I ask about sexual health, not sexual life. Mm-hmm. And people here, do you care about my sexual life? But I'm saying sexual health, which includes mm-hmm. my sexual life and yours. But you know that nuance matters. The bias comes out too. And I love it. I love it when a when a physician will be like, "Sure, yeah." And like so, I know that they have it. They're not used to it, but they still could be an ally, and that's what we all need. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for all the work that you do. I mean, you really do bring this conversation to the forefront and in such, I think, such an accessible way for everybody. 
I know in all your work and your your groups and your courses and your talks and everything, there's so much so much value in that. And I really I hope everybody you know checks it out because we all can learn learn more about this. And it's an evolution. So you, so you you don't get done right. Changes over the course of a life. And sexuality, it's fluid. Like you said, it's fluid. And it's one of the few things we all have in common. And uh, we we need to have a society that allows for for that fluidity to be normalized. Mm -hmm. Yes, normalized. That's exactly it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Juliana. It's it's such a pleasure. I know we could we could talk forever. (laughs) So many more things I'd love to get to maybe we'll come back sometime and we'll we'll get to those it's really been a pleasure thank you so much and again thank you for diving into this space it it really helps everything evolve and i appreciate your questions thank you take care thank you for listening and being part of the conversation please find a way to validate yourself today maybe find a way to validate someone else too and if you enjoyed the show please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also join me at No Not Crazy on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Let's build this community of validation together.